this time, Karen Jones is coming and she will do uh, the eulogy. Good morning to everybody. On behalf of the family, I want to thank you for coming today. It means a lot to them. I know you love Charlie as much as we all did. This is a day that the Lord has made. I will be glad and I will rejoice. Are y'all rejoicing today? We know where Charlie is without a shadow of a doubt, don't we? I want you to turn to your friends. I want you to smile, okay? Show your teeth, show your false teeth or your gums. And remember the last time Charlie made you laugh. I first met Charlie at First Baptist. I had just retired. My best friend, Deborah Ward, decided she needed to introduce me to every table that was there in the building and tell them that I was a retired nurse from hospice and uh, that I would be able to take them to buy groceries or whatever. And she said a few things probably that weren't quite true about me. I'm really a pretty honorary person. Uh, Barbara Lester was sitting at that table, Billy Hopkins and Jim Peoples, and there was Charlie. Charlie took one look at me. He said, my wife was a nurse and she died. I didn't know what to say. I looked at him, I said, you know what? I'm planning on checking out myself any day now. I want to be in the Lord's presence. Uh, I knew that Charlie was gonna be maybe a hard nut to crack but I was up for the project. I knew I could do it. I asked him what he did. He said, I'm a mechanical engineer in electrical. I said, okay. I have five children. I have a dog named BB. What else do you need to know about me? <laughs> so I said, oh, okay, Charlie Smith, hard-headed Charlie Smith. It really didn't want to be my friend. I said, I'm gonna force him to be my friend. I said, well, Charlie, I put two, three guys through mechanical engineering program. I know your personality. I think we can be friends. I sit under my breath. When I got home that day from church, my phone was ringing, and there was a timid little man on the phone. Uh, Miss Jones, uh, this is Charles Smith. I met you at First Baptist, and I was not very friendly. I said, yeah, you were kind of snobbish, weren't you? I let him have it, because I saw potential in Charlie. Um, he said, did you mean it? You wanted to take me out to eat, really? I said, yeah, I eat out every day. Okay, he said, not knowing what to do, if he really wanted to go out and eat with me. Well, I met him at the restaurant, and there was his friend, Jim Peoples. They were partners in crime, let me tell you. We, the three of us bonded, we became buddies. Every morning I, before I woke up sometimes, Charles would call. He would say, hey, good morning, what you doing? I'm still asleep, Charles. <laughs> Where are we gonna eat today? Jim and I are functioning at the bits, we're hungry. We had breakfast this morning at six o'clock. And I said, okay, tell me where to meet. We'd go out to eat, and these guys would have me in stitches. We were like the Three Stooges. I would just mention something, something that had gone haywire in my life that day, and they would find something funny to laugh about it. Just, just have me in stitches crying. I wanted to be with them. We frequented uh, Ed Walker's, we went to Miss Anna's, we went to Benson's for breakfast, we went to Village Inn. There was probably a few restaurants that we never got around to eating in. Uh, however, there was one restaurant we got asked to leave. You see, this restaurant in Barling, and if I knew the name of the restaurant, I would tell you, but I don't know. Oh, wait, actually, it went out of business. There was a bench on the front porch. And so Charlie would walk uphill with his walker, and by the time he got there, he was out of breath. He had sat on that bench, here'd come Jim, and here I'd come bringing in the tail. And he'd sit on that bench, and we'd talk for a little while, and he would say, let's go eat. Well, one day we popped up at the restaurant, the bench was gone. 
Charlie had to struggle up the hill, catch his breath at the door, and then walk in and have breakfast. He said, something's not right here, and I know it. That bench should still be there. He asked to speak to the owners, and he asked about the bench. He told the lady who he was. He was, I'm 87 years old, and I've depended on that bench to sit on every time I come here to catch my breath, to be with my friends. He threw it, and I always leave big tips. <clears throat> anyway, the lady doubled her arms, and she said, I got rid of the bench because there's a homeless man sleeping there, and he doesn't belong there. This is my business. Charlie said, I'm going to make it my business. Me and my friends who eat here all the time, and like I said, always leave a good tip, pester your waitresses, get a good meal. We won't be back, and we never did. Charlie turned as we walked out the door. He said, ma'am, I'm going to pray for you. I am pray that you get a heart for the homeless people. I'm going to pray that you're success, and I promise we won't be back. Charlie, Charlie was all about learning things from the Bible. He uh, started 60 plus at First Baptist Bible study on Tuesdays. He went to Bible study at the VFW in Greenwood. He wasn't a veteran, but he went anyway. Uh, then he came to Rye Hill and studied. And on Sunday nights, Charlie and Jim Peoples and I went to Riverfront Church with Pastor uh, Jim Miller and we met the homeless. Charlie had a love for the homeless. He had a love for everybody. I don't care if you were Democrat or Republic. If you weren't his political, political party, he'd say, I'll pray for you. <clears throat> uh, Charlie wore many hats. One of the hats he wore was visiting people from Heart of Hospice, where he took his last breath. I would go see patients as a volunteer, and we would sit with people while their wife went to the grocery store. I would introduce him as our hospice chaplain, although he didn't have the title. He was qualified to be the hospice chaplain. He would share comforting words. A lot of times he would read the Psalms to our patients. But he would say, thanks for taking me. He would meet these people. And maybe it was the first time they'd heard about God. Maybe it was the first time they had heard about salvation. He also did the Walk for Life. Uh, the Walk for Life was a, a fundraiser for the pregnancy center, a pro-life pregnancy center. He walked with his walker. He pulled out his checkbook at the fundraisers. He believed in supporting the unborn children. One Sunday after we ate lunch with Jim and Deborah and Ron and a, a, a restaurant full of friends, we had three tables. Jim said, I'll see y'all, see y'all tonight at uh, Riverfront Church with the homeless people. Charlie was in the middle. Jim called Charlie, my, said that I was Charles' girlfriend. We agreed. We, he, was, he had so many girlfriends, it wasn't funny. They were, he said, they're girls and they're my friends, but they're not really my girlfriends. But... We, Jim would always remind him, you know, hey, it's here, we got to quit talking, it's time for church to start. After church, Charlie was the first person to get up, shake the hands of the homeless, it's so good to meet you, and, and he would just witness to them. If, he, if they needed a hug, he would reach out and hug them. Sometimes almost too hard they couldn't breathe. That's, that Sunday night, we hugged Jim. We said, okay, we'll see you Monday morning for breakfast. And we went our ways, expecting to have a good breakfast and uh, share good times with our buddy, Jim Peoples. That morning, Charles called me, and he said, I got something to tell you. Jim's not having breakfast with us this morning. I said, that dirty rat, why is he not gonna eat breakfast with us? Because he went to heaven last night. Our little group came down to me and Charlie. We added friends as time went on that joined us for breakfast. <clears throat> uh, it was a hard blow for, for all of us, but Jim had lived 94 years. 
He was with the Lord, and that helped. Charlie would talk about, you know, one day, I'm going to see the Lord. I'm going to see Diane. I'm going to ask Noah how in the world he built that ark without uh, plans. I'm going to ask to see the plans. I'm going to ask him where he knew to put each piece of wood. I said, oh, yeah, only an engineer would do something like that, would want to meet Noah and ask how the ark was built. Uh, he loved to talk about growing up in Oklahoma. He was raised poor. He took a job picking grapes, made $5 a day, and his one goal was to buy a pair of Levi jeans, which he bought. He uh, would tell me stories about doing things with his brothers. They were just quite, quite interesting characters. He would talk about riding his motorcycle. And then he would get a little quiet and he'd say, did I ever tell you about meeting Diane? Well, we were in school together. And he said, I was shy. She was the prettiest girl in the class. She could have dated anybody. And I just never got my nerve up to talk to her. So one day, she came over to me and she says, Charles, I have a surprise for you. And he looked at her. Again, shell-shocked, he couldn't talk. She picked up his books. She threw them out the two-story window. He was able to talk to Diane after that. <laughs> Years later, his eyes would fill with tears when he talked about her and how much he loved her. His only regret was wishing he had married her sooner. He would talk sometimes about the day that he would enter in the Lord's presence and he would be with her. Diane had a vision for a big family. At one point, they decided they traveled abroad, they went to the Holy Lands, and they felt the Lord calling them to adopt two children. It was Diane's dream. Charlie wanted her to have any, anything she ever wanted. He felt that their family was complete. His kids grew, to, his family grew to five children. Charlie worked in engineering for McDonnell Douglas. Uh, he was a mechanical engineer. He was what you call a job shopper. What that meant was he would look down the newspaper, he would scan the newspaper and he would see a job that he was interested, looking for a design engineer or maybe just something that caught his eyes and he would say, uh, I'm gonna apply for this job. He had many qualifications for the job. He was talented. He had designed a street sweeper that's still in use today and many other little things. So this time he decided he was gonna, gonna dummy down his resume. So instead of having a four page resume, he kind of dummied it down. They hired him and he said, mm, I don't know, I think I can do this, but I'm not for sure with a laugh. He ended up uh, working for NASA, uh, designing landing gear for the Columbia and the Challenger, which, which crashed due to an O-ring failure, breaking its wings and taking the lives of the astronauts. He attended Rye Hill Baptist Church with Kim. He made new friends. He called me the night after he first visited, and he said, hey, that brother Mike, he's a man of God. He really is. He's kind of like David. He's a man after God's own heart. He said, you know, sometimes I doze off, but I can still hear every word Charles says, every word. He's a man of God. He would always say that about his pastor. In April, Charles's health began to decline. Uh, after all, he was 87 years old. Kim took him to the doctor's visits, hospital stays. Um, he would um, always make friends with the doctors and the nurses. He had a thing for nurses. He would always tell me that he was being good to the nurses. He was bragging on them. And he would talk to him about Jesus. He had a little pamphlet that he passed out everywhere. He would call me and he'd say, you know, Dr. So-and-so would be a doctor with a name about this long. He would say, I gave him one of my papers. He kind of looks like he might be a Muslim. I would shake my head. Yes, Charlie, you're right. He is a Muslim. He took my paper. Wouldn't that be something? If he read my paper and he accepted Jesus as his Savior, 
That was his focus. That was his true focus. Nobody should be left behind. As Kim alerted her, her siblings, that she called them and told them that Charlie's time was gonna be short and the doctors were talking hospice. The, the, the phone calls came. He had asked, Leah, how are the twins? Debbie, are you calling from the City of Hope Cancer Center? Is your cancer still in remission? Ben would call. Ben, you still driving that big truck? How's the baby? How's the wife? You're coming to see me at Christmas time? He would get so excited. Each year, we would do something special for his birthday. He would, uh, we would invite friends, they would come. One year, we all wore black mustaches. His friend Tanya had a really sense, neat sense of humor. We wore mustaches. There was about 20 people there, and we all had mustaches. Some of these women are here today. You remember wearing the mustaches for his birthday party? Then we wore Billy Bob teeth. He enjoyed it. He really did. He would always brag about his family, especially his great-granddaughters. One was to follow Diane in nursing. The other was to get a degree in criminal justice. He called him his girly girls. He loved them. He would still tell you today that he's very proud of you, and he's proud of the accomplishments that you've made in life. I want to thank you all for sharing your dad with me. Uh, Kim, I want to thank you personally for fixing all the meals. Charlie would call me on Friday or Saturday or Sunday night sometimes. He'd say, hey, Kim's fixing cornbread and beans. i say, with onions? Yeah. I said, I'll be there. Kim's fixing chili. Kim's fixing fried chicken. It just continued. He thought his job in life was preventing me from eating a bowl of cereal for supper. He cared about me eating right. While Kim was in there slaving in the kitchen, Charlie and I were watching American Pickers. <laughs> we were watching TV. We were having a good time. We were laughing about the, the time we'd spent with Jim that week and the different things that happened. When Charlie couldn't sleep at night, he would get up. He would turn the TV on. Kim was fast asleep. And he would watch the program called Reflections. It would have beautiful music. There would be scripture. And often Kim would find him sleeping in his chair the next morning. She knew that he, had, he was trying to decide, what do I do tomorrow with my, limited, my limitations? What can I do? Kim called Brother Mike and he talked with Charlie for a long time. He was able to give Charlie the peace that he needed to meet the Savior. He worried about leaving Kim. He worried about friendships that he would have to say goodbye to, but he knew he would see us all again in heaven. The last night Charlie was with us, Kim and I sat at the foot of the bed. Charlie was in a coma. We sat at the foot of the bed. We talked about your dad, your grandpa. We talked about how God had brought two people together you see, when I met Charlie, he had just lost his wife. And I had just lost my dad. And we grieved together. We, God had united me with this man that was very sad from losing, and I was very sad from losing my dad. That night at the hospice, uh, I asked him to take her daddy's hand, and I took one hand. They were not my words that I said to Charlie. They were God's. I didn't plan to, I didn't, I was just going to hold his hand. And the Lord said, tell Charlie I'm waiting. Tell him I'm waiting. I said, Charlie, we've had a good time. We've had a good friendship. We've been together for a long time, eight years. Now it's time for you to take the hand of Jesus. Reach out and take his hand now. Charlie's next breath was in heaven. We knew he was with Jesus. He just needed permission to go on and be with the Lord. He was in the presence of our Lord. He was looking in those eyes. He was hearing the Savior say, well done, that good and faithful servant. 
He had a special friend during this time, actually two friends, his neighbor, Elizabeth and John. When Kim had to go to work, they became a very important, he would say, Elizabeth and John are in my fan club. They spent endless hours with Charlie. They made, they made his day special. He had nothing to fear because she was there. And he would say a big thank you to you today, Elizabeth. I want to share with you my favorite Bible verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope. Charlie had hope and he had a future. And when he entered into the Lord's presence, the Lord said, welcome home, Charlie. Great is your reward. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I appreciate that. She knew Charlie well. We are here today to honor and to celebrate the life of Charles F. Smith. He was 87 years old of Fort Smith, Arkansas, who passed from this life on Wednesday, August the 14th, 2024. He was born April 22nd, 1937 in Allen, Oklahoma. And we kidded each other several times about being Okies, uh, just surplanted. <laughs> and uh, he was born to Sybil and Charles Smith Sr. Uh, in life, Charles always had three things uh, to live by. Love the Lord your God with everything, love your neighbor as yourself, and love your enemies. With those three, no one is left out of being loved. Charles was preceded in death by his wife, Diane who was truly the love of his life. He told me that several times. And his parents, Charles Sr. and Sybil, brother John Smith, and brother-in-law Clayton Allensworth. Left behind to cherish his memory are his children, uh, Randy and his wife Ruth Bruss, uh, Dave, Dave and his wife, R Dave and his wife, uh, Rita Smith, Kim Cox, Debbie and husband Larry uh, Mal Malakow, uh, Leah Smith, siblings Bob and Claudia Smith, Anita Allensworth, sister-in-law Sandy Smith, along with seven children and six great children and many friends who will miss him dearly. I'd like to read from Ecclesiastes, cha Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3. To everything there is a season and a time and a purpose under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die a time to plant, a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain, a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to a tear, a time to sow, a time to keep silent, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. What profit has the worker from that which he labors? I've seen the God-given task with which the Son of Men are to be occupied, and he has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to the end. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. It is the gift of God. Father, I thank you for Charles's life, and God, I just thank you that he knew you as his personal Lord and Savior. And God, I just thank you for his family, and God, we lift them up to you today, and God, I pray that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, uh, would just be with them. And God, I pray that they would just have those snapshots of those pictures of the good times uh, that they had together. God, I thank you for Charles' uh, dedication to you and his love uh, to attend church. Lord, I thank you for his ministry of passing out things and pamphlets. And God, I just thank you, Lord, that he, he really did. He fought a good fight. He finished the race. And God, we just praise God for that. So God, be with uh, the rest of this service 
and especially be with the family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Amy and Vicki. Just uh, praise the Lord for knowing Charles. And Karen, you said it well. He was a fine man. He liked to have a good time. And uh, man, he loved the Lord. You know, I've known Charles for the past several years, and he has been a blessing to me personally, especially this last year. Uh, we have had many conversations about life, the Bible, and the book of Revelation. Charles had a full life with many adventures and changes of address and job opportunities. In most of our talks, the things uh, we usually ended up talking about was our love for motorcycles. Uh, I've got a Harley, and he thought that was cool. He said, I'm not sure I met a pastor that had a Harley. And uh, we, we kidded about that, but he was talking about motorcycles that I have never even heard of. All right, the 1940s and the 1950s and having bikes there. So we had some great conversations there. Uh, we both rode bikes most of our lives and talked about the joy that we felt riding in God's uh, beautiful creation. Uh, Char Charles and I, we called it uh, road therapy when we rode. Today I'd like to share with you three things I know about Charles Smith. Number one, Charles loved the Word of God. There was no doubt in my mind. Uh, he was a student of the Bible. He read it daily and tried to apply what he learned into his personal life. Charles wrote many booklets on, uh, on books of the Bible. Over the last several years, he has given me many of those which I have kept. Many dealt with the book, many dealt with the book of Revelation also. We agreed on most of the stuff, but we uh, respected each other uh, when we had, di had differences about Revelation uh, because there's so much symbolism and, uh, we, but we were always able to get uh, past that. 2 Timothy 3.12 reminds me of Charles. Yes, all uh, who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Many times we would talk about what is going on in our world and how Satan is just blinded. Uh, folks of the truth of the word of God 
But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you learned then, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which is able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the men of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Charles and I, we would defend the Bible, and uh, we love the Bible, and we talked about the Bible a lot in our conversations. The second thing I want you to know, Charles, he's not hurting anymore. The last six months have been extremely challenging to Charles and his failing health, back and forth from the hospital to home, and being poked with needles hundreds of times, not being able to breathe or control his shaking uh, took a huge uh, toll on Charles. One of the last conversations that we had, uh, I was there and I said, how are you doing? And he looks at me, he says, I'm dying. And you know that smirk that gets on his face. And I said, Charles, we're all dying. He said, no, I'm ready to go home. And Kim, we had talked about going home and I said, because he loves to sit on the porch, and I said, where well, are you going to sit on the porch? That's, that's what you want to do. He said, no, you don't understand. I'm talking about home. I want to go see Diane. And boy, I tell you, uh, the love he had for her and really just uh, one of the things he said, too, was I'm just tired. I'm just physically tired. And praise God, he uh, released Charles from his body. Second Corinthians I love this scripture uh, that reminds me of Charles. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heaven. For in this we groan earnestly to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked, for we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may uh, be swallowed up by life. And that was one of the things Charles told me many times. He said, I can't wrap my head around this heaven. I, I mean, I know there's heaven and I know you preached on it, but I cannot imagine me being perfect, okay, and my body being perfect. And I would assure him, I promise you, Charles, that's what's going to happen. And the Bible says, now he who has prepared us for this very thing, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And I know being around him, the Holy Spirit was inside of him, and it worked on him. It, it works on all of us. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Charles had a strong faith. Str Charles had a strong love for his Savior. We are confident, yes, well pleased, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I tell you, when, he took, when Charles took his last breath here on earth, he took his first breath in heaven. And I believe with all my heart, it, there's no walkers up there. There's no limping up there. There's no breathing hard up there. He is in heaven, walking the streets of gold in his glorified body. Kim, you did an outstanding job taking care of your father. You went above and beyond what most would do for their father. And Charles told me many times how much he appreciated you. Third thing I'd like to share with you, Charles doesn't have any regrets anymore. For the last couple of months, Charles kept telling me he had many failures and regrets in life. I did my best to share with him that God has forgiven him of the past, and it's, it is called history. I also told him nobody is perfect, and everyone has regrets in their lives. I just jotted it down, uh, some men in the Bible, and uh, what, what they were before they found Christ. Noah was a drunk. Abraham doubted God. Jacob was a liar. Moses killed a man. Samson was a womanizer. David was an adulterer. Jonah ran from God. Peter denied Christ three times. Saul persecuted Christians before he was saved. 
John questioned the deity of Christ while in prison. And I tried to tell him about guilt. There is true guilt and there is false guilt. True guilt is conviction of the Holy Spirit. False guilt is Satan bringing up your past and trying to make you miserable. And even that day that we talked, uh, he told me, he said, Brother Mike, I want to rededicate my life to Christ. And he did that uh, there in the hospital bed. And I'm just telling you, it seemed like from that point on, things changed in his life. I told him three words, and, and he looked at me really strange. I said, let it go. And I said it again, Charles, let it go. And tears started rolling down his eyes. He said, that's what I needed to hear. Philippians 3 puts it like this. And this is Paul speaking, not that I've already attained or already am perfect. And folks, there's no perfect person. And we all have regrets. I have things I did before I was saved that I regret. But it's covered by the blood. But I press on that I may hold, lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but the one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And I press towards the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Some people think the upper call is heaven. No, folks, I'm telling you, when you get saved, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and nothing can take that away. The upper, the cause that he is talking about here is holiness. Every day, we need to repent of our sins. We need to uh, just make sure uh, that, that we are doing the right thing in everything that we say and everything we, we do. And I love 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I'm telling you, uh, Charles uh, did that. And Charles, uh, just looking at him, even today, Kim, and at the hospital, he just looks so peaceful now. And uh, he's been released uh, from that body. Well, the question as we close is this. What about you? If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Oh, folks, that is the most important question anyone could ask you. And if you're not sure about that, the Bible is clear. In Romans 3, 23, he says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that God gave Jesus his only son who lived a perfect life as a sacrifice for our sins. The Bible tells us Jesus died on a cross for our sins, but three days later, he arose. And if, they, if we will repent, if we will ask for forgiveness of our sins and invite Jesus into our life, we can have eternal life. And folks, I am so glad Charles did that. I am so glad we have the assurance of salvation uh, in, in our lives. A missionary was in a prison cell and he he was he it was going to be put to death and he scratched this on the wall no return no reserve no regrets all right folks we can clear our conscience by being right and if you have went to our church very long you know the three things i say i ask myself every night am i right with god am i right with my family Am I right with my fellow man? And if I put no on any of those, I do business with the Lord and I can go to sleep and rest in his love. I'd like to close with this poem and it's called, I Am Free. Don't grieve for me, for now I am free. I'm following the path God laid for me. I took his hand when I heard him call. I turned my back and I left it all. I could not stay another day to laugh, to love, to work, or to play. Tests left undone must stay that way. I found that place at the close of the day. If my passing is left a void, then fill it with remembered joy, a friendship shared, a laugh, a kiss, 
Ah, yes, these things too I will miss. Be not burdened with times of sorrow. I wish you the sunshine of tomorrow. My life's been full. I've savored much. Good friends, good times, a loved one's touch. Perhaps my time seems all too brief. Don't lengthen it now with undue grief. Lift up your hearts and share with me. God wanted me now, and he has set me free. Oh, folks, we can be free from guilt and free from sin if we, by faith, will put our trust in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for Charles. God, I thank you for his strong commitment to you. And I thank you for his love for you. If you talk to him very long, he would talk about the Lord. He would share information about the Bible. And God, I thank you for the ministry that he had. God, I pray again that you just bless this family. And God, I just pray, Lord, that you would just watch over them. And Lord, those who have driven or flew, Lord, I pray you give them traveling grace. So God, thank you for everyone that's here. It's just a testimony of how much he was loved. So God, just be with us as we close this service. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. And God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray today would be the day of salvation. And God, I, I know what would happen. The Bible says the angels in heaven would be rejoicing. And I believe with all my heart, Charles will be rejoicing also. So God, he loved his family, each and every one of them. And God, I pray that we would continue to love and serve you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.